July 14, 1999, three seasoned iron workers rose 300 feet above Milwaukee, trusting their lives to a machine called Big Blue. By sundown, all three would be dead, the city's new stadium in ruins, and $200 million lost. Colleagues had warned of dangerous winds, unsteady ground, and ignored alarms that morning. But the lift pressed on. Why were their warnings dismissed? And how did tiny overlooked details set off one of America's deadliest crane disasters? The answers begin with the men suspended in that basket and the fatal choices made before dawn. Jeffrey Wisher, William DeGrave, and Jerome Starr arrived early that July morning, each carrying years of experience and pride as members of Iron Workers Local 8. They were fathers, husbands, and brothers in the trade, hand-picked for one of the most demanding jobs in modern construction, working from a suspended platform nearly 300 feet in the air. Their task was to guide a 450-ton roof panel into place above Milwaukee's new ballpark, trusting their lives to the massive blue lattice of steel beneath their boots. The three men knew the risks. That morning, as the sun rose over the city, they stood together and studied the sky and the wind. All three spoke up about the conditions, gusts already tugging at their gear, the ground underfoot not feeling quite right. They voiced their concerns to supervisors, worried about the wind and the stability of the crane's base. But the project was behind schedule, and the answer came back. The lift would go on. Family and union records later showed that these men were no strangers to danger, but they never accepted it lightly. Each had built a reputation for speaking up, for looking out for the crew. Their names, Wisher, Degrave, Star, are now etched on memorials and remembered at every union gathering. On that final morning, they did what iron workers always do. They put on their harnesses, checked each other's lines, and rode the man basket skyward, carrying both their skill and their worry with them. At the heart of the operation stood the Lampson LTL 1500 Transi Lift, its twin crawler tracks pressed into the earth, the lattice boom stretching high above the stadium floor. By 7 a.m., the wind had already picked up, steady at 15 to 18 miles per hour. The original crane operator, a veteran with years of heavy lift experience, reviewed the conditions and made his decision. He refused to proceed with the lift. The wind, he argued, was too high for a safe operation at this scale. He pointed out what others had started to notice. The ground beneath the massive tracks felt uneven, not as firm as it should have been for a structure weighing millions of pounds. Crew members watched as the steel pads pressed deeper into the soil. Subtle shifts hinting at something unstable below. Despite these warnings, the timeline for Miller Park loomed large. Supervisors turned to a replacement operator, someone willing to take the controls and keep the project moving. With the schedule under pressure and the stadium's opening already delayed, the decision was made to continue. The replacement operator climbed into the cab, accepted the handover, and prepared to lift the enormous roof panel. As the crew gathered below, some iron workers quietly packed their gear, uneasy with what they saw. The official logs from that morning later recorded the operator change, but the concerns about wind and ground stability were left off the paperwork. The job pressed on, with risk now woven into every step. Formal complaints about the wind and ground conditions were delivered to supervisors throughout the day. Some iron workers refused to climb higher, packing up their harnesses and tools in protest. The job boss received direct warnings, not just from workers on the ground, but over the radio as the afternoon wore on. Radio logs later reviewed in the investigation captured repeated caution calls, crew members urging leadership to reconsider the lift as conditions deteriorated. Safety protocols required functioning wind alarms, but after the collapse, investigators found that two critical wind monitors had dead batteries. 
the alarms that should have warned of dangerous gusts were silent. With no single person empowered to halt the operation, responsibility was scattered across contractors and site managers. Even as warnings multiplied, no one held the authority to issue a stop work order. The decision to proceed was shaped by a fractured chain of command, where safety concerns were voiced but not acted upon. The system in place failed to protect the crew, leaving gaps that would soon prove fatal. Every safeguard meant to catch the warning signs. Radio calls, wind alarms, clear authority was either ignored, inoperative, or missing when it mattered most. Wind readings at ground level that afternoon told only part of the story. Anemometers near the base of the Lampson LTL 1500 clocked steady winds between 22 and 24 miles per hour, with sudden gusts reaching as high as 35 miles per hour. But higher up, where the 450-ton roof panel hung, the wind was even fiercer. At over 300 feet, the air moved faster, stronger, and less predictably, a fact well known to engineers but too often overlooked in daily operations. The panel itself, 200 foot wide, acted as a giant sail. Every gust pressed against its surface, multiplying the force that the crane had to resist. Calculations after the disaster showed that each spike in wind speed added hundreds of pounds of sideways force, force that the original load charts never accounted for. The charts used on site were built for vertical weight, not the drag created by a massive panel swinging in turbulent air. Safety footage from that day captured a flag at the boom tip stretched straight out, snapping in the wind. The image later reviewed by investigators made the invisible visible. The wind was not just a background hazard. It was an active, relentless force, hammering the crane and its load from the side. Engineers who studied the collapse found that the wind gradient, the way wind speed increases with height, had been underestimated. The boom tip and the suspended panel were exposed to stronger, more chaotic gusts than anyone on the ground could feel. Without real-time wind data at the top, the crew below had no way to know just how hard the wind was pushing against their lift. The planning gap ran deeper than a missed reading. Standard practice at the time relied on load charts that ignored lateral wind pressure. The only numbers factored in were the weight of the panel and the vertical lifting limits of the crane. Lateral loads, forces pushing sideways, were left out, even though industry guidelines and the crane manufacturer's own instructions warned that wind could destabilize a lift of this scale. In the hours leading up to the collapse, the combination of a massive panel, a high boom, and powerful shifting winds created conditions that exceeded the design assumptions. Every minute the lift continued, the unmeasured force increased. The wind, once treated as a variable, became the dominant risk. It was a risk built into the very physics of the operation, yet hidden by paperwork and tradition. By the time the panel was suspended high above the stadium, the wind was no longer a background concern. It was the force that would push the limits of steel, engineering, and human decision-making to the breaking point. Beneath the Lampson LTL 1500, the ground told its own story. The crane's twin crawler tracks, each supporting hundreds of tons, pressed deep into the soil that once seemed solid. In the days before the lift, workers noticed something unsettling. The earth under the tracks no longer felt firm. Some described a subtle give, a softness that set nerves on edge. By the afternoon, those who walked the crane pad could see faint depressions where steel met earth, as if the weight above was slowly winning a battle with the ground below. Geotechnical investigators would later study the base's response to the massive loads. They found that the soil, though prepared for heavy machinery, was vulnerable to changes in moisture and pressure. Even small shifts in water content could undermine stability. On the day of the collapse, a broken water main just 20 feet from the crawler's path had been leaking for days, unseen and unchecked. Water seeped through the subgrade, loosening the compacted fill 
and creating hidden pockets of weakness. Witnesses on site recalled seeing the tracks settle further as the crane began its lift. The change was gradual, almost imperceptible at first, a few millimeters, then centimeters, until the machine sat at a slight but dangerous tilt. Some iron workers pointed out the uneven settling, voicing concerns that the base was no longer level. Their warnings, like so many others, were brushed aside as the schedule pressed forward. After the collapse, engineers measured the aftermath. The ground beneath one crawler track had sunk noticeably, enough to shift the crane's center of mass off balance. This uneven subsidence concentrated stress on the kingpin assembly, already under strain from the wind and the weight above. The Lampson LTL 1500 was designed to distribute loads evenly across its base. But with the soil compromised, the forces became unpredictable. The crane's foundation, a system meant to provide certainty, had quietly become a source of risk. The combination of saturated soil and shifting pressure set the stage for disaster. When the wind pressed against the suspended roof panel and the bronze spacer in the kingpin assembly began to fail, the unstable ground offered little resistance. The base's tilt amplified every lateral force, turning what might have been a recoverable event into a catastrophic sequence. In the end, it was not just steel and wind that brought Big Blue down, but the silent, persistent weakness beneath its tracks, a weakness that had been growing, unnoticed, as the deadline approached. At 5.12 p.m., a sharp metallic crack rang out across the stadium. Forensic modeling would later trace that sound to the bronze spacer buried deep within the kingpin assembly of the Lampson LTL 1500. This half-inch spacer, never part of the original design, had been installed to fill a gap and tighten the kingpin's fit. But the bronze was too soft, its yield strength just 19,000 pounds per square inch, far below the steel it touched. Under the combined force of wind, shifting ground, and the immense weight of the suspended roof panel, the spacer fractured. The brake released a shock estimated at 4,000 kips through the heart of the crane. Four seconds after the first bang, a second, deeper sound followed. The kingpin, a 12-inch diameter shaft meant to anchor the crane's upper works to its crawler base, sheared cleanly and shot from its housing. With that, the upper structure lost its anchor. The 567-foot lattice boom began to buckle at its midpoint, steel bending as the massive load swung out of control. The boom collapsed in a matter of seconds, striking the suspended man basket and sending the 2.4 million pound counterweight plunging into the ground. Each step in this chain of failure, spacer, shock, kingpin, boom, unfolded with mechanical precision, the result of forces that had been building all day hidden until the moment they could no longer be contained. The stadium grounds erupted in chaos as steel and debris crashed to earth, sending workers scrambling for cover. Emergency sirens wailed through the dust and tangled wreckage. Paramedics and firefighters pushed past fallen cables and twisted lattice, searching for survivors. Within minutes, teams reached the mangled man basket, but Jeffrey Wisher, William DeGrave, and Jerome Starr were already gone. Five more workers, pulled from the collapse zone with broken bones and deep cuts, were rushed to waiting ambulances. The ground, still trembling from the impact, was littered with fragments of the crane and roof panel, evidence of the disaster's scale. Authorities moved quickly to secure the site. OSHA and NIOSH investigators arrived within hours, cordoning off the wreckage and launching a formal probe. The Lampson LTL 1500 Upper Works, now separated from the crawler base, became the focal point for forensic engineers. Specialists from Engineering Systems Inc. began collecting steel samples, documenting the kingpin failure and mapping the pattern of collapse. Computers ran finite element models to reconstruct the forces at play. 
tracing the sequence from wind-driven sway to catastrophic overload. Every piece of debris, every broken connection, was catalogued for the record. The investigation would soon reveal a web of technical flaws and missed warnings. But in those first hours, the priority was clear. Rescue the living, recover the lost, and begin to understand how a single lift had gone so fatally wrong. Legal accountability for the collapse landed hardest on Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, which the jury found 97% responsible for the disaster. Lamson International, the crane's owner, was assigned the remaining 3%. OSHA levied $540,000 in fines across the main contractors, citing failures in wind assessment, exceeding crane capacity, and permitting unsafe work practices. Civil lawsuits pushed the costs far higher. Each family received settlements for loss and suffering, while punitive damages reached $94 million. The total economic toll, damaged stadium, insurance claims, and settlements surpassed $200 million. Out of the wreckage, reforms reshaped the industry. Boomtip anemometers became mandatory, with real-time wind monitoring logged for every critical lift. Load charts were rewritten to include lateral wind forces, not just vertical weight. Soil stability testing is now required before any heavy crane operation. Most importantly, any worker on site can now halt a lift if conditions are unsafe. These changes, born from tragedy, helped drive a 40% reduction in crane-related deaths nationwide over the next decade. The lessons paid for at Miller Park now set the standard for construction safety across the country. Every major stadium built today relies on lessons carved from disaster. Wind sensors at every boom tip, stop work power in every hand, and ground checks before every lift. Yet as projects grow larger, industry pressure still tempts shortcuts. The true cost of ignoring risk is not measured in millions, but in lives forever changed. Safety is not a line item. It is the only legacy that endures 